<laughs> so we're just waiting for Anne. I just sent her a note by email, uh, but I haven't heard back from her. Be so right Patrick, this is Candace. So oh, she was, says she's waiting, Eli, to get in. It was 2012 that New York was bidding for the game. It was in 2005, and they were bidding for the 2012 oh. version. Yes. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. And I'm just trying to figure out whether one of either you, Candace, or Sharon, uh, would have been in Austin when there was the ambulatory and the wheelchair athletes on the track at the same time and near chaos uh, training. Mm -hmm. Were you in Austin? What what year was that? 1990. Um, no, I don't think. Uh -uh. I'm gonna go live with that, and you're saying that Anne she may have joined the regular link, so we can promote her. Yeah. So she says she's waiting to get in. Okay. Yeah. Once we let everyone in, then we can promote her in. Okay. In '90, Patrick was that in Aston? Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There was a shortage of training facilities, so somebody in their infinite wisdom decided to run training sessions for ambulatory and wheelchair at the same time on the track, which made for some interesting exit and entrance strategies. <laughs> and can you hear me? Hi. Awesome. I went in the wrong way. Sorry about that. No problem at all. Hello, Annabelle. Hey, how are you, Bob? Good, good. How are you? Hanging in. Good. Ah, yes, the Dr. Stedward reunion tour continues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Patrick. Hello, man. I, I won't, don't think I was born when we were doing this stuff. <laughs> it, it was an elementary project. <laughs> it was. It was a grade school, for sure. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so, Eli, we're gonna—are we live? Yeah, we can get going. Yeah. All right, let's do it. I'll go ahead and stop, sir. Good. Yeah, we can go ahead whenever you're ready, David. Well, good morning to everyone. Thank you to the participants who are uh, just logging in now and joining us. We're excited to be back with a, a Stedward Talks. Eli, I think this is our, our ninth or tenth, something like that. Um, for those of you who are new to the Stedward Talks, these originated a couple of years ago, um, really between a conversation with myself and Eli Wolf. So I'm David Legg and I'm a professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And Eli uh, is a faculty member at the University of Connecticut and also an advocate for persons with disabilities and based out of Boston. And the two of us were involved with organizations, one called IFAPA, the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity, and the other one called Disability and Sport International. And between the two of us, I think we recognized that there were a number of conversations, a number of stories that in our estimation had not been well documented. Um, they were not... Uh, published widely. They were stories, urban legends, uh, some cases myths. And so we started to think that it was perhaps time that we started to record uh, some of these stories to, to try and keep track of them to ensure that we don't lose the specifics within them. And today's story is, is a perfect example of that. Between 1984 and 2004, there were two wheelchair demonstration status events that took place in the Olympic Games. And there were similar events that actually took place in the Winter Olympic Games in 1984 and 1988. And again, I would say that there's very little that has been written about uh, these events online, in, in print, and certainly within academia. And so we're very excited to bring together with us today a number of speakers who have the lived experience of having attended, participated, and helped organize those demonstration status events. Um, as I mentioned, these, these talks are called the Stedward Talks, and they were named after my mentor uh, and academic advisor for my PhD at the University of Alberta and the founding president of the International Paralympic Committee, Dr. Robert Stedward, who in a moment I'll be asking uh, to provide some introductory remarks. If he's a little less than lucid, it's because yesterday was his 75th birthday, and I believe he's Aww. been up all night celebrating. Um, so I was going to actually try to have a, a, a like a, a, a singing happy birthday, but I'm not sure that, 
I'm not sure that works in a Zoom context. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that we don't do that and we just you know wish him quietly a uh, happy 75th birthday celebration. So Dr. Sedward, can I ask you to provide some opening remarks and then turn it back to me where I'll then introduce our speakers for today. But just to provide a little bit of context to these, you know, the, the talks and more, more importantly, these demonstration status events that happened just prior to you becoming the president of the IPC in 1989. Well, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, David. And uh, good morning, everyone on air and uh, watching all of this. Uh, before I give a couple of remarks about the the background to the demonstration events that started in 1984, I I, I just want to recognize that uh, that everyone I think is very fortunate to have three outstanding uh, Paralympians with us here today, two of which experienced uh, the demonstration events in in Los Angeles, uh, and as well. Uh, one of the most respected uh, sport leaders in Canada who was uh, involved back in the initial days of putting these events in place. But let me give you some context to this event. Prior to the creation of the International Paralympic Committee, sport for athletes with a disability were really managed and controlled by 12 people, uh, three from ISMGF at the time, uh, three from ISOD, three from IBSA, and three from CP ISRA, representing Dr. the- Dr. Sedward, can I, can, can I just yeah. get you to, to the full acronyms, just so the people have a full understanding- Oh yes, the, the International Stoke Mandeville Games uh, Federation, the International Blind Sports Association, the Cerebral Palsy International Sport and Recreation Association and the International Sport Organization for Disabled. That primarily in those days represented uh, uh, amputees. Uh, and it was the president, the technical officer and the secretary general from each of those organizations that represented all of us around the world. And then this group was called the International Coordinating Committee, and they formed in 1982 and governed all of our Paralympics until 1989 when IPC was formed. So after they were formed in 82, one of the first things they did was to try to develop a relationship with the International Olympic Committee and actually met with uh, the president at the time, uh, Juan Antonio Samaranch, and it was during this meeting in 19, I think it was in January or February of 1983, <clears throat> where a couple of things came out of it. One, they cannot use the word Olympic. And secondly, that perhaps they could work together to put in place a demonstration event for the games in 1984. Um, but they did approve later on that we could use the word Paralympics, but it never was until IPC was created. So they did say that in Sarajevo for the winter and in Los Angeles for 84, we would have demonstration events. The challenge being which events? And I'm sure that uh, Sharon and Candace and Patrick and Anne can talk more about that uh, later, but there was a lot of uh, difficult discussions within the ICC because the visually impaired, the cerebral palsy, spinal cord injury were all represented and all trying to fight for their sport to be part of it, uh, including team sports, which IOC didn't want to have anything to do with it because how do you bring in 12 teams, 150 people or eight teams or whatever. So it seemed more practical because of the sport of athletics to have the track events and the Alpine for Sarajevo. Just a couple of other things I'd like to leave you with so you can get those wheels turning. Uh, after ICC was created in 82, they had the meeting with IOC. There was rumblings in the world because 
nations weren't represented to help direct where sport for athletes with disabilities should go. So actually 1984 and Merklinger and myself uh, were both uh, with the, wasn't known as then, but the Canadian Paralympic Committee, we put together a proposal, submitted it to ICC to say, this is what sport should look like in the future that would include uh, nations. And that started the discussion, which led to the 1987 Arnhem seminar, which was basically where the discussion of the International Paralympic Committee started. 23 resolutions were, were put forward and accepted, most of them unanimously. And one of the key things that was created was inclusion. And of course, IP, IPC eventually created the Committee on Integration for Athletes with a Disability, of which Anne was responsible for, along with Rick Hansen, to drive this, uh, this committee. So I think I've said well enough. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of taste as to uh, the background uh, that happened with the ICC and the relationship with IOC and, and how everything took place. So thank you, Dr. Lake, and back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Severd. So as you noted, we have uh, four speakers with us today that all have varied perspectives on these demonstration status events. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly uh, introduce each of them. And then we have a, a fifth speaker who's just a last, a like a late addition, although Ted, Ted has been involved with the Stedward Talks from the initiation um, and is one of the founding members of kind of creating these Stedward Talks. So Ted has come in and out of these several times, but Ted has a very interesting perspective actually on these events as well. So I'll get to that in a minute. So our speakers include Candace Cable, who's joining us this morning uh, from Los Angeles, and Candace is wearing the black turtleneck with the, with the black rimmed glasses. <clears throat> you know, if nothing else, when I was looking at the, the bios of our four speakers, this also could be a session talking about the value and importance of multi-sport uh, training um, and the, the benefits of, you know, being active in a variety, variety of sports. So Candace competed, as I mentioned earlier, in 1984, but she also competed in the 88 and 92 Olympic Games in the demonstration event, and it was the 800 meter wheelchair race uh, for female athletes. She also competed in the Winter uh, Paralympic Games, and I think there were five total Winter Paralympic Games that Candace competed in, and then finally in marathons. And if I recall, I think it's 84 marathons that you've competed in in total. Um, um. Is that no, that's uh, that I won. Oh, the <laughs> There's a whole bunch more I was in I didn't win. <laughs> oh, well, well, sorry. Uh, eight more that you won. So <laughs> by comparison, I competed in the Melbourne Marathon and finished, I think, in around the 10,000th spot or something like that. So yeah. So anyways, congratulations on your winning 84, 84 <laughs> marathons. Holy cow. So, well, it Candace, so David, it was, it was definitely... Um, my wheelhouse. It was <laughs> marathon was the thing that I was pretty dedicated to. And so Apparently. <laughs> at that time we all had to do everything. So right. Yeah, no, exactly. So thank you. Thank you for joining us, Candace. I'll I'll come back in a minute. I'm, I'm gonna get you to speak to your experience in 84. Our second speaker is Sharon Hendrick, who's joining us this morning from South Carolina. Uh, she also competed in the 84 and 88 Olympic demonstration status events in those same 800 meter events, and she won both of those apparently. Um, and she also is a, a, a champion in wheelchair basketball. So again, uh, uh, competing in, in multiple sports and in marathon. Um, and you were the first female wheelchair competitor in the Boston Marathon, if I have that correct, going back yes. to 1977. Um, and yes. you competed in Paralympic Games between 76. So those would have been in Toronto, the Toronto Olympiad for the physically disabled. Those would have been your correct. First. And then right. 92 in Barcelona, um, yes. where you won medals in wheelchair basketball and wheelchair track. So, uh, uh, Barcelona was just basketball. But... Just basketball. <laughs> now, I thought Canada, I thought Canada won the gold medal in wheelchair basketball and women's wheelchair basketball in Barcelona. Is that correct? In, ba in Barcelona. That's back when we were good. Yeah, I know we took silver. I'm trying to remember who took the gold. 
I yeah, know. I think it was Canada. <laughs> I think it was. As a Canadian, I have to I have to brag. <laughs> And so Sharon then also competed in Barcelona at the same time as our third speaker, who is Patrick Jarvis, uh, who's joining us from Calgary this morning. And now Patrick's best line, I believe, is that he had the death grip on 12th place in his track event uh, in Barcelona. Now, Pat may not be as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, decorated as uh, Sharon and Candace in medals. However, he does have the acclaim of having defeated me in multiple occasions in both golf, in going out for just casual jogs, and in also pickup basketball. So that's really his athletics claim to fame, I would say, here in Calgary. And Patrick is one of my very close friends, so I was thrilled to have him join us today. But Pat's involvement with these demonstration status events is that he was president of the Canadian Paralympic Committee for a number of years. And during that time was in the final stages of the demonstration status events and actually wrote a rather terse letter to the IOC uh, leading up to the games in 2004 in Athens. And I'll let Pat speak to that when I give him an opportunity, but really just challenging and, and the assumptions as to why we would continue with demonstration status events. And then our final speaker and last but certainly not least is, um, is Anne Merklinger. Uh, Anne is also a multi-sport athlete, so having been on the national team as a swimmer and then a medalist at the World Championships in curling, if I recall. I think you were a bronze medalist in curling. So again, a, both a summer and a winter sport athlete. Um, this really is a, an ad advertisement for the multi-sport uh, training process here. Um, Anne uh, has a, as a background as an administrator. Dr. Sedberg made reference to this earlier. In a Canadian sport context, she's now the CEO of what's called Own the Podium. Um, which is a, an umbrella organization that, as the name suggests, is really ensuring and trying to uh, enable Canadian athletes, Olympic and Paralympic athletes, to uh, be medalists and own the podium in Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, she has a background also with uh, canoe kayak, but, but specific to this conversation is that she was the executive director of what became the Canadian Paralympic Committee, and then in 1990, after a year after Dr. Sedward had become president of the IPC, she became the executive director of what was then referred to as CIAD, uh, the Commission for the Inclusion of Athletes with a Disability. And this was a commission within the IPC that was chaired by Rick Hansen, a wheelchair track athlete from Canada who was on a previous Sedward's talk, Sedward talk. Um, and it was tasked with trying to be uh, try to encourage events for athletes with a disability to be included into more traditional able-bodied sporting events, such as the Olympic Games. And so Anne's role was, was really trying to build upon those earliest forays in 1984 and 1988 and moving forward as to the, you know, whether or not those demonstration status events should continue and how they should continue and, and so on and so forth. So we'll get to Anne in a minute as to her experience and perspective with that. And then our final speaker, I mentioned earlier that we've added a fifth is uh, Dr. Ted Fay, who's just uh, in Massachusetts with us this morning. Um, and Ted and I have done a number of projects together in academia as it relates to inclusion. And in particular, the Commission for the Inclusion of Athletes with a Disability. Um, and Ted actually has the distinction of having marched in the opening ceremonies of the Olympic games as a representative of uh, disability sport in Calgary, which is where I'm now physically based um, today. And I, this was, a, a, I, I think, the only time that that's happened. Um, and so the Winter Olympic Games also had demonstration status events in 1984 when they were in Sarajevo and 1988 when they were in Calgary. And those ended after the 88 Games, whereas the Summer Games continued again, as I mentioned earlier, until 2004 in Athens. All right, I've said enough. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to start with you, Ted, and, and what I want you to do is talk a little bit about your experiences from the Winter Games perspective, just as so we can provide a bit of context. And then what I'm going to do is Sharon and, um, and Candice, I'm going to get you to talk about what it was like to compete in Los Angeles and in Seoul. Then I'm going to ask Anne for you to kind of talk a little bit about your experience as executive director with SEAD and we're going to try and do it in a chronological order. And then Pat, I'm going to come back to you towards the end and talk a little bit about, you know, kind of why you wrote the letter that you did to the IOC and your kind of perspective on those demonstration status events. Okay, without further ado, Ted, can I get you to just start with yeah, a brief description of your experiences in the Winter Games, 
um, and talking a little bit about the demonstration status events both in Sarajevo and in Calgary. Dr. Ted Fay. This Ted's this is Ted's first Zoom call, so he's just learning. Muted. See, I can get this to do over. <laughs> Um, as I said, I'll try to commit to being as concise as I'm, you know, able to do. So here goes. Um, I was not in Sarajevo because that was an Alpine only event. And it was, uh, basically for standing, um, athletes, mostly amputees. Um, and it was not specifically a three track event, um, for those of you who understand what I'm trying to say is two outriggers, one ski. Um, so that was an Alpine event. Um, so I was not involved directly uh, because at that point in time, I had just taken over moving from being a race guide for a totally blind skier, starting my Paralympic experience in 1980 in Yilo to taking over being um, a newly formed, if you will, multi-disability represented US disabled cross country ski team. Uh, that was 84. 80, 86, we integrate. This is an important factoid, I think, is in 86, we integrated the U.S. ski team, both Alpine and cross country disabled teams, into the actual U.S. ski team. So when we actually have a chance to now be represented both with Alpine skiers, both male and female, three trackers, as well as cross country skiers, we had a male athlete. Uh, we did not qualify any female athletes, it was eight athletes per discipline, so a total of 36 athletes. Um, anyway, so in what was unique in Calgary is we were there, uh, our athletes were there. I was there as a head coach on the cross country side, as well as I had just taken over being the ISOD uh, cross country chief, if you will, uh, under the old ICC that, that um, Bob had referred to. But the other thing, that, so there's several interesting elements. I'll just kind of lay them out on the table. So in Calgary, what was different than the summer exhibition events is we had blind athletes, totally blind athletes, cross country, men and male and female. We had three track skiers, alpine, giant slalom, male and female. So you already have added and expanded um, that sort of representation of athletes with different disabilities. Uh, unlike the summer games um, experience. Number two is we were there, and I will speak from a US experience, but uh, that we were there as part of the full delegation of the US Olympic team. And we were treated as other demonstration sports that were competing for the first time. And that was short tracks, uh, speed skating, freestyle skiing, al um, alpine different freestyle, as well as curling. And we all were together in the same um, satellite demonstration Olympic village, which also created a whole different experience. So this whole social inclusion was treated the same, looked the same, acted the same, supported the same. And as uh, David alluded to, I was fortunate along with our other athletes to march in both opening and closing ceremonies. Uh, so we had a full Olympic experience. And at the same time, we were also lobbying the International Ski Federation very directly. Uh, you know, they got tired of me talking to them every day about this, of actually projecting forward a demonstration at the next world championship in Nordic skiing, which would take place in Latte, Finland in 89. And with the idea of setting up the possibility of an inclusion or full inclusion in the FIS World Championships in 1991 in Val di Femme, Italy. Now, we were in Lati, we were not in Val di Femme, that didn't happen. But if you kind of overlay this at the same time, other things were happening with the creation of, you know, the IPC. Um, you know, you have a lot of political you know, fireworks going on. But at the same time, what we can say is for the athlete experience and for those of us who are in administrator or coaching roles, um, we had our Olympic experience. We had a true Olympic experience um, in, in that treatment. Um, and that sits as an outlier. We expected to be able to push that forward also at the 92 uh, Winter Games in Albert Deltine. And the French didn't want 
really, they weren't supportive of this. And essentially that ended the winter, winter games experience as an exhibition or demonstration. And I would also parse the words, it's one thing to be treated as an exhibition, which I would argue the summer games were an exhibition. The term was used, that was the label. Whereas in the winter games in Calgary, we were treated as a demonstration sport, which gave us the feeling that perhaps in the future, the whole idea of integration inclusion was a possibility. I wanna build a little bit on that. And actually I, I lied, I'm, I'm gonna come back to Sharon and, and Candace in a second about your experiences in 84, but just briefly. So Ted, you mentioned that the 88, 88 experience was multi-disability which was never the case with the demonstration status events um, in the summer games. They were always the same two wheelchair events, one for men, one for women. Multi-disability and multi-discipline. Yeah, so I wanna spend some time, and this was again, pre-IPC. So Anne, you would have been, and you would have been the, C, the executive director of, again, the Canadian Paralympic Committee and Dr. Sedward, you would have been the president at that time of the Canadian Paralympic Committee. Like who, who negotiated these? Like how did, how did these two wheelchair events even become to be in the 84 games? And who was it that made the decision for the inclusion in the Sarajevo games? And then who made the decision ultimately for the multi-disability and multi-discipline game uh, opportunities in the 88 games in Calgary? Like how, how did those happen? And then I'll come back, sorry, to Sharon and Candice and your experiences in Los Angeles. Like I, I, and I'm not asking anybody in particular, because I, I honestly don't know how that took place. If anybody can illuminate me, Bob, your your best position to give the history on this one. Um, <clears throat> well, again, it goes back to the days of ICC. Um, they first discussed it with uh, Sam Ranch and the IOC at the first meeting. Uh, of the IOC in January of 83. So it only really had a year to move forward with those two events. And one of the problems that I think led to the demise of those events eventually in 2008 and 12 and beyond was because there was a lot of um, disagreement within the ICC at the time which event should be put into the 84 winter and summer games and beyond. And because other disabilities and other disciplines wanted to be involved, uh, Samaranch and the IOC just said, sorry, I mean, we're, we're only prepared to include these events. And then of course we had difficulties is that now taken away from the status of the future Paralympic Games if these events are within the Olympic Games, et cetera. So there was, there was likely more challenges within the ICC and the Paralympic movement, if I can say, trying to decide which event, because everyone wanted to be part of it. IPSA wanted uh, their, uh, their discipline at the uh, in Calgary and uh, and not just give it as they did in '84 to the uh, standing alpine uh, skiers. So it did create problems. And I must admit that Samaranch even told me in Calgary, he said, "I'm not very impressed with the Nordic event. I mean, these can't be truly outstanding, high performance athletes." because they've got a recreational skier guiding them around the course. So we, so there was a lot of challenges in that, but I think a lot of it came from within our own movement within ICC. They were charged with the responsibility of deciding which event should go on. And at the time, there was a technical officer for each of the four uh, organizations but they didn't have the Ted Jays of the world that were involved in the sport, uh, involved from the countries that could help make those decisions. So I don't, I don't think they may have been the wisest decision at the time, but uh, that's how it took place within the ICC anyway. If I can add on that, two, two points. One is at that point in time, the, what would become the Winter Paralympic Games, and this was in Innsbruck, 
those were, those were competed in January and they served as qualifying events for Calgary, mm -hmm. both Alpine and cross country. So there was no conflict as to a follow on. And this is kind of, you know, mixed up in terms of presentation. The second thing is I totally agree with Bob and I had major arguments with Jerry Johnson about this. I said, can anything change? Because your best athletes cross country, Sandy LaCour coming to mind, who lives in Banff, is the, the reigning world champion and Paralympic champion in the visual impaired class would present very differently than the B1 class, which I agree with Bob, we, we, at that point in time, we just did not have the athleticism consistently throughout those eight skiers. What's ironic is the US skier, John Novotny, was being guided by the captain of the US Olympic team in 1980 in Lake Placid, Craig Ward. So a long time, I mean, maybe John didn't ski fast enough for a Samaranch, I don't know, but I can tell you the giant slalom was dramatic um, in terms of presentation by contrast. Uh, and I agree, there was a mistake made. It wasn't visually compelling enough because the choice of athletes in terms of class was, was not going to be understood. No disrespect to those athletes. It just, the, the, the sport had not developed well enough. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Dr. Setter, for kind of that background. And again, for those who are listening in who maybe are not, you know, historians of Paralympic, Paralympic Games, um, 84 and 88 for the Winter Games, they were both held in Innsbruck, Austria. Correct. And at that time, the the precedent of hosting both Olympic and Paralympic Games in the same city had not yet taken place. And that, that happened in 1988 in the summer in Seoul, Korea. And so Calgary, my own you know, home city here, did not benefit, I would say, from that precedent having been set. Because again, going back to the 80s, the Olympic winter and, and, and the summer and the winter games were held in that same year. Okay, so I want to come back now. So we've talked a little bit about kind of how these events got uh, set up. I, Candice and Sharon, I, I, again, I, I was in grade 10 at the time in 1984. So, you know, I was, <laughs> I was more worried about, you know, when Van Halen was touring and when, you know, when they were coming to Toronto and I could go see them at Maple Leaf Gardens. So I have to admit, I, you know, this it was kind of was over my head, but I want you to talk a little bit about your experiences in Los Angeles and what it was like to compete in the Coliseum, uh, in the very first demonstration status event. And then the other thing I want to talk about, and Sharon, I saw you nodding your head, this difference between exhibition and demonstration. And it's funny because those terms get, I think, used as synonyms, but I, mm -hmm. I, again, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure I know the difference between the two either. And so if you're able to speak to that, I think there'd be some value in that. To my understanding, uh, a demonstration event is an event that the uh, IOC at that time was considering moving into the Olympic Games as a full medal sport, an exhibition event. Go ahead. And so again, my understanding is, is that they were referred to as demonstration status events from 84 until 2004. Is that, is, is that, am I Our correct? events, our track events were considered exhibition events. Oh, okay. Not a full medal. Um, sport, although we were given medals, um, it was not included in the total medal count um, and was not really under consideration, at least at that time, as something that was going to be integrated fully into the Olympic Games. It was there purely to show people this thing. So, so in 84, it was referred to as an exhibition event. Correct. Did it ever transition into being called a demonstration status event or were they always just called exhibition events? Now that, um, I didn't stay around until 2004. I went into other areas, but uh, I know in 88, it was considered exhibition event. Maybe Candace would know. Uh, in 92, I would suspect 
And I know some people that went in 92 from where I was training at Illinois that it was still considered exhibition. I don't think it ever got to the point that it was considered a demonstration event. That's Does anybody my... know that? Does, can anybody else comment on that as to whether what the nomenclature was? If, yeah, so the first time that it was really what, what Sharon is referring to as a full medal event, which was really the distinction between um, the hosting of events previously was in Victoria at the Commonwealth Games in 1994, where the two uh, wheelchair events, uh, wheelchair track athletics events were full medal events. The, um, the same medal was awarded to the winning athletes, the athletes uh, medal tally the, to the nation tally. So it truly was what we were, were driving for at that time was full inclusion of full medal events in designated world championships, multi-sport competitions, and ultimately the Olympic games. And that, so that never happened in the Olympic games though, up until 2004, that was never considered full medal status, but did it, did it ever transition from exhibition to demonstration status or were they always exhibition? Well, the, what had happened, David, is during the discussions between the ICC and the IOC, besides talking about which events that they would have in the next uh, Olympic games, which they were prepared to change them as long as they didn't go beyond sort of the scope and size of the previous events. Uh, I know in my discussions with Sam Ranch, he'd, he'd always refer to them as demonstration, even though we all understood uh. that they were exhibition, because at the time the IOC was discussing the mm. events and many countries didn't didn't want the athletes to be part of their Olympic team with uniforms and staying in the village. Uh, the IOC didn't want them to be counting towards the medal count as, as Sharon has rightly pointed out. Um, but even given that, Samaranch looked at it that we're demonstrating to the world that we'll include your people and we can showcase your events, but they're really exhibition events by definition because they okay. would not become a full medal sport like they did as Anne pointed out in the Commonwealth Games so yeah. And they were chronicled historically if you look at the chronicling of the event um, you know who won what medals etc cetera, etc cetera, from a historical standpoint they were never even existed in, in, in terms of you know, being part of that history, whether it's Walensky's history or who else, um, you know, chronicle the games. So, you know, whether Samaranch used it, you know, just casually, I don't think you'll ever find it listed formally and officially as demonstration. Gotcha. The only thing that I was able to find was on the new Olymp Olymp uh, Olympic Encyclopedia that they've just published. They do have some information in that regard. Um, what now, are they, what let's are they go back. back. I was just going to mention, I'd love to hear from Candace and Sharon just a little bit on the experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we're definitely coming back to that. Thank you. Eli. Okay, so let's come back to 1984. Sharon and Candace, you had a chance to compete in those first exhibition events in Los Angeles and the Coliseum. Rick Hansen, I think, competed in the men's event, um, if I recall. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. So Candace and Sharon, tell us about that experience, what it was like. Sharon, you all already made reference to the, to some of the nuanced differences. And Candice, maybe I'll start with you then just to talk a little bit about your experience. Because those would have been, I think, your first Olympic Games. Well, I guess they had to have been because those were the first ones that did it. <laughs> yeah, and this is Candice. Uh, and um, I use the pronoun she and her. And I'm zooming in from the occupied lands of the Tongva Nation, which is Los Angeles. And those games we all knew, uh, definitely for sure, the Americans and the Canadians talked about it, that it was going to be a paradigm shift for disabled people in general and, and for our sports. We, we all knew we were on display in many different ways and, and talked about it. A lot of the interviews that were happening at the time when we were you know, going from where we qualified in New York to Los Angeles we're always peppered with, you know, being able to change the image uh, that people thought about disability. And, and uh, so there was a lot riding on it for a lot of the athletes. And uh, 
I know in the men's races, they talked about not, you know, not having to crash, having a clean race, having a really, having a, you know, a really good race, you know, to show uh, what, what we're capable of and, and change all the different layers of stigmas and bias and stereotypes around disability. And uh, there almost was a crash <laughs> during the men's race, which was really interesting. And it really shows the true testament to the athleticism of it. But the, um, when we found out that they were going to happen, you know, my recall on it is, I know that Muffet Kaufman started making a movie of it called Choosing Victory. And so it was a full length film where she interviewed several of the athletes that were going to the trials in New York, where we got picked, uh, where we earned our spot actually for the top eight for women and the top 10 for men. And then followed those athletes all the way to the Olympic games when we were a part of the, the event on August 12th. And, you know, honestly for myself, uh, after finding out that the Paralympic Games weren't going to happen in the United States, uh, that my races were going to be over in England, I had to choose then what was I going to focus on uh, because I couldn't actually afford to do both uh, financially. And I chose the Olympic Games because I thought that that could be a much bigger impact because we were already road racing I had started road racing in 78 and I realized right then that we had a real opportunity to get some real inclusion in road racing that we didn't really have in a lot of other spaces. Mm -hmm. And so there was a group of us that started an organization called the International Road Racers Club. And then we devised the guidelines for race directors, the rules for road racing, where to position us, how to talk about us in the media, the prize structure, all of this. And we traveled all over the US. Just, we raced, that's why I think I got the 84 wins, is, <laughs> is that we raced everywhere. And we met with race directors before the events to help them create this wheelchair division and integrate us in and alleviate their fears. Cause there was always so much fear around our sports and disability and all of that. So we knew that the advocacy piece and we knew the exposure piece was going to be really critical when we heard about this race happening. And yeah, so my focus was on that. I, I just, and I remember the excitement of it. Uh, our first trials in New York and all of us together and knowing what was to come and the stage we were to get on, I mean, we were gonna be in front of 80,000 people in the Coliseum, a billion and a half people internationally. We're gonna be seeing us on television. They chose to do an up close, uh, up close and personal for television. And I was chosen as that person. There were articles in People Magazine about us. There, there were, we were on a stage that we had never been before because I mean, most of us have been competing in front of our family and friends and maybe 25 other people that had shown up for different races or events or our nationals, right? And so that, that whole idea of being able to create this real shift in perspective really weighed, I think, on, on all of us. And then, you know, to try to win the gold medals was the whole other piece of it. And that, uh, I'm gonna talk about the moment of going into the stadium for me, because it was so overwhelming. There was, this was a stage that I had never been a part of. And going into that stadium and hearing the roar of the crowd of 80,000 people was really super heady for me personally. And it, I worked really hard to focus on the moment. And I just remember looking around and thinking, this is our future, you know, we can have this. And, and whether it's in the Olympics or the Paralympics, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. I, I always thought that the event was a really great advertisement for the Paralympic games, but I don't really think that Paralympic names, games need the advertisement anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I don't, I don't know so much when I think about the bigger picture of including all of it together and, 
I, you know, I think there's a lot of really great messages that come forward when it's separated because of creating a human experience for everyone where there's equity in opportunity is really the critical piece. And uh, using sport because it's such a great tool for promoting that connectedness. It's got a great universal language that everybody understands. And so we knew that going in there. So we, you know, we, we were, we were in the village for the week before. And if I recall, and Sharon, you can have to help me with this. I think all we got was a tracksuit really, um, that was the same tracksuit that the non-disabled racers were at athletics people like Carl Lewis, who was competing on the same day we did. Um, that we're competing in. And we had tank, we had singlets, and then we warmed up on a warm up track. We came through this dark tunnel into the Coliseum, and it was this huge bright light, all the yelling. It was such a powerful moment for me. And I tell people what happened to me in that race was one of the moments that really helped define what I thought was possible for inclusion for people with disabilities. And I was racing to win, um, but there was this feeling of something bigger throughout the whole thing. And, and, uh, and when we finished it and then the men, and then the men raced, it really felt like there was this, this sense of accomplishment that again was so much bigger than any of us. And for myself during the race, I really had out of bodies experiences because it was, the energy was so powerful in so many ways. And I, you know, and I had the same kind of experience when I competed in the 88 games, the Olympic games and the 92 Olympic games. And in 92, I had competed also in the Paralympic games, the winter and the summer ones. So I had three big events in the 92s that I kept building this, this idea of being able to change that perspective. You know, um, I have to say that as the Coliseum as a venue is a really powerful place to be inside of. And, um, and I wanted to let you all know that on the wall of the Coliseum, they list all the races um, from 1984. And the exhibition of races and the names of the three medal winners and the men's and women's are on the wall there. So, so it is being recognized in some ways, not all. And, uh, and uh, there's a book about one that you know, David Davis wrote about the 84 games and it's recognized in there also. So, you know, I think talks like this and recording this history is really important to the next level of where we take our sport and how we deal with our human rights and our inclusion. And I'll stop there because awesome. uh, I can yeah. talk. <laughs> Thank you, Candace. And so Sharon, I do want to get your perspective too on those, on those first games in 84 and then also your experiences perhaps in 88 in Seoul and perhaps even to Barcelona. And then I'm gonna to move to Anne and then I'll, I'll finish with Pat. But I think it's important just to provide a little bit of context to some of the com you know, comments Candace were making. So at that time, the Summer Paralympic Games in 1980 were held in Arnhem because the, the Russians declined the opportunity. And so the, the Olympic Games were held in Moscow. And in 1984, again, the Olympic Games were in Los Angeles. The Paralympic Games, now Sharon, you, were, you went to the University of Illinois. I don't know if you were there then at that time, but I think the yes. University of Illinois was supposed to have hosted the Paralympic Games, ultimately declined. And so to your point, Candace, they split them. So I think the wheelchair events were held at Stoke Manville. And right. the, other, the other disability events were held in New York City, in Long Island, I think, somewhere. Yeah, so, exactly. And, you know, so Dr. Sedward, you've referred to Seoul, Korea as being kind of the birth of the modern Paralympic Games. So I would say, and I don't mean any disrespect, but, it, you know, the level of sophistication with a Paralympic Games, I would say it was not particularly high in 1980 and 1984. It was still kind of somewhat grassroots and perhaps under the radar. And at the same time, I mean, you think about those early 80s, that's when Terry Fox did his, you know, Marathon of Hope in Canada. Rick Hansen had still yet to do his, you know, wheel around the globe, his, his man in motion tour. I think 81 was the international year of the disabled. So there was a bit of this burgeoning, you know, I, I had a chance to watch Crip Camp. 
um, not too long ago, and this idea of a social movement for people with disabilities. So I think there was a, a bit of that undercurrent too, you know, mm -hmm. to some of the conversations and comments that you were making, Candice. Again, I talked well, to and, yeah. and we were, and this is Candice, we were really clear on that movement, you know, because in 77 was when disabled people took over the federal building in San Francisco and sat in for the longest takeover of a federal building ever in the United States till this day to get the Rehabilitation Act signed and the regulations implemented. So that was then the catalyst that was pushing us towards the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we were right in the middle of that, yeah. right? 84 was right in the center of all of this movement to create civil rights, human rights, uh, opportunities for people with disabilities and sport was such a great vehicle to bring that forward. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as we don't get caught up in our own internalized ableism, uh, we really can build off of sport oftentimes to really create those kind of spaces. And um, yeah, so it, it, we, it wasn't really exploding time. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, you're welcome. Sharon, I'm sorry I've taken so long to get back to you. Share us your experiences, again, being in Los Angeles and then perhaps, you know, moving to, to Seoul and Barcelona and your experiences and competing in these demonstrate or these exhibition events. I would say, um, first of all, that uh, because Los Angeles declined the Paralympics, that uh, Professor Tim Nugent at the University of Illinois stepped up and said, well, I'm gonna to try to have them at the university, excuse me. And um, there was not much cooperation between uh, the IOC and the Paralympic uh, organizers in terms of sponsorship that in fact the Olympics would not even let us call it the Paralympics at that point. They just flat out said, no, you can't use that. And uh, then they also had told uh, Dr. Nugent that don't go to any of our sponsors for money. So uh, as hard as he tried at that time, he was unable to raise the funds to have them in Illinois, which is why they ended up mm. in England. So it was kind of by default. Now, in um, 84, like Candace, I was selected for the Paralympic team for basketball and track. And those two sports have always been near and dear to my heart. And uh, I made the decision at that time that the importance of what was happening in Los Angeles in terms of exhibiting what athleticism exists in the disability community was more important than going and doing my other heart's desire. So uh, going to Los Angeles, I came in a little bit late after the opening ceremonies because I had stayed at home. I wanted to work with my personal coach a little bit longer. And I know everybody thinks opening and closing ceremonies are great. I'm unfortunately not one of those people, uh, but that's just me. Uh, I went to race and to showcase my sport. And so to stay home and work with Marty Morris, who was coaching me, 
I went in late, say about maybe three-ish days before the event and uh, got a little bit of practice in on the track that they were letting us use at the time. And truthfully, maybe it is because I came in late, but I didn't really feel very integrated with any of the able-bodied track people. And as Candace said, they gave us a, I think it was a copy. It wasn't the actual track uniform. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that allergies in South Carolina, excuse me. Um, they gave us the warm up suit. That was it. And it was a copy. It was the one that you could go buy at JCPenney. So, uh, and then our uh, own governing body at that time, National Wheelchair Athletic Association, gave us a little singlet to race in, USA on the top. And uh, so I was there, but I didn't feel really included. And especially knowing that it was an exhibition event. However, that's not to say I didn't take it seriously because I took it exceptionally seriously. Gave up my basketball and said to myself, well, you know, uh, again, this is a showcase event for disabled sport. And it was also an event that was one of my strongest track events and had kind of made up my mind and told my coach that, uh, you know, I don't care what you have to do to me. Um, I really want to win that event. Uh, so uh, we just knuckled down and uh, did everything we could. Uh, stopped my basketball training, focused exclusive, spoke, uh, took me off the road for the most part and uh, focused on track. Uh, I went to Los Angeles and uh, I think um, the, the wheelchair racers kept pretty much or at least I did to ourselves, uh, at least up to the race time. And uh, going, uh, preparing on that day, August, I can't remember. <laughs> I think it was August. Um, it was. Okay. Uh, got no sleep the night before, basically, uh, for nerves and um, got up that morning and went down and ate a little something and went back and started dressing and getting prepped, making sure all my equipment was in good shape. And then we were all gathered into a, a holding area at one point. Uh, there was something else I think going on at the time, might've been the race walk, but nobody else was in the stadium yet, except perhaps field events. And it, it really was quite an experience to enter the stadium and see all those people up in the stands. It was like nothing I had ever seen or felt in my life. Just the energy of those people. And I really felt like they appreciated it, mm -hmm. what they were about to see. Probably most of them had never seen it before. 
and maybe some of them are scratching their head a little bit, but uh, so for me, again, entering the stadium, I got the rush of the crowd and so forth, but then uh, at that point, my focus turned totally to what I had to do and what I wanted to do and all of the scenarios of how it might play out uh, just real quickly through my head again that I had gone through with my coach, uh, what I was going to do at 200 meters, what I was going to do at 500 meters. Uh, that had all been really structured out for me. And the crowd faded away for me. And my focus was, okay, get in your lane, get your warm up done. Um, and uh, tune out everything else, which was actually maybe pretty remarkable considering so many people were there and I never experienced that, but I was able to do it because I remember from the time um, that and they were lining us up and making sure we were not over our lines and uh, the gun going up in the air and the get set, the gun going off. Uh, and when that happened, it was just total, here's what I'm supposed to do if somebody gets in behind me. Here's what I'm supposed to do. Um, if nobody's behind me. And again, where I look, who I look for, like Candace, um, who I expected to be tucked in behind me, but it was someone else. Um, and Sharon, Sharon, I can truthfully, I I'm sorry. I just, I, I, wanna, I wanna pause for a second. Okay. If, I, if I may, and I apologize for interrupting you. Sure. Um, I, I want to make sure that we get to Anne and to Pat too. And I just, I'm just conscious of time. Okay. Um, but I want to- Oh, you're getting in the head of an eraser. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I want to come back to this though, because I'm loving, I'm loving the story of the race. Um, okay. So maybe if we can, it, are you able just to, to finish kind of the conversation about what it was like to be in that race and to not have Candace right behind you? Um, oh, and then wow. We'll, and then we'll move on to Anne. I was surprised, first of all. And then uh, and then basically everything else tuned out except the fact that Monica Saker was in behind me instead. So the strategies that I planned to use if someone was behind me is what I did. And uh, through my final kick in a little early, which is when Monica dropped out because she wasn't expecting that. And then just cleared to the finish line. And at that point, probably at about 750 meters, I heard the crowd roar again because they were getting very loud. They saw a USA person about to cross the finish line and they always got real excited uh, when that happened. But that's when I really heard and felt that rush again of holy Moses, I am in the Olympic games and uh, crossing the finish line and uh, relief. I was done <laughs> and uh, I didn't even look at the clock until about 15 or 20 seconds until after. And I looked up and it, <laughs> my friends teased me about it. They see me clapping at some point after the race. <laughs> and I wasn't, you know, like, Klee, yay me. It was like, oh, I finally looked at the clock and oh, it was my best time ever that I'd done. So I went, yay, that's a great time. And um, we were, 
at that point, it was tremendously exciting. It, up to that point, the most sports exciting experience of my life and not knowing what was going to happen, perhaps of my lifetime. Um, and we were shuffled off, the men got on, did their race. And then I believe we waited a little bit for the medal ceremony um, so we could get our uniforms on, things like that. But as Candace said, the, the main thing other than I wanted to go in there and cross the line first, but the greater picture was of exposure to an able-bodied population of something that most of them had probably never seen before and doing it well, doing it safely. Um, it's a sport I felt was very easily understandable, you know, track who crosses line first. That's not too hard to understand for the average person, but it was certainly uh, at that point, just the greatest experience I'd ever had. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And I wanna come back to, particularly Pat, when we get to you, I wanna talk about whether or not it continued to be a good exhibition for persons with a disability within an Olympic context, but we'll get to that in a minute. So Anne, I want to kind of pick up on the chronology here. So the first games were in Los Angeles, the second were in Seoul, and both uh, Sharon and Candice, you competed in those. And then Anne, yeah. you were hired as the executive director, again, of SEAD, the Commission for the Inclusion of Athletes with a Disability, which was a commission under the auspices of the IPC, of which Dr. Sedward was the, the founding president in 1989. And it was chaired by Rick Hansen, who we made reference to, who also raced in the men's race in 1984. And, and, and the CAD's role, its task was to pursue inclusion for athletes with a disability into able-bodied sporting events. You made reference to the game, the Commonwealth Games in Victoria as being an example where they were included as a full medal status. But I want, I want you to spend some time telling us a little bit about your experience in how you manage these exhibition events within an Olympic context and what your negotiations were with the IOC. And I, I, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, it was only still wheelchair athletes that were included in 84 and 88, ultimately throughout all of the games. But if I recall correctly, I think there was a push from CAD to try to have other disability events included as well in Olympic games. And I want you to tell us a little bit about that, please. Sure. Thanks, David. And, and let me just say, it's just such an honor and a privilege to be such, with such an esteemed group of high performance athletes. Uh, congratulations, Candace, Sharon, Pat, and Ted. And sharing your stories is, is just so profound. So thank you for that. Um, I worked in disabled sport for 10 years, uh, sport for athletes with a disability for 10 years. And it, it truly was uh, the most rewarding time in my career. And Bob, Dave, you mentioned Bob was one of your mentors and, and still to this day is a mentor of me. So thank you, Bob. Um, you know, I think we've heard so well from Chris and Sharon and Ted, the impact of the exhibition events on sport for athletes with disability and the deserved recognition and um, appreciation and awareness that those exhibition events created in high performance sport around the world. Um, our role with the Commission for Inclusion of Athletes with a Disability was to take it to the next level so that there was there was equal and full recognition and that you didn't get a copy of the tracksuit from JC Penny. You got the real tracksuit, full kit. You got the same medal that um, you know a, an able-bodied athlete would receive. You got you your mental performance has contributed to the overall nation tally. So those all may seem like, well, at the time I remember Bob and Rick and I, you know, kind of presenting this lobby, this advocacy effort to Sam Ranch and his colleagues, just to say, well, you know, these may seem like small things, but they're profound in terms of the status and recognition of people with a disability. And in this instance of athletes with a disability. So, you know, we, 
we had marginal success, I would say. Victoria was really the only time that we were able to achieve that. And at the same time, the Paralympic movement was being transformed. The Paralympic movement, you know, what, what are we 30 years later and look at the status and depth and mm -hmm. recognition and importance that the Paralympic games have on the world. It, it, it's globally been transformed. And so we were in that middle, uh, you know, in that messy middle part where the Paralympic Games were just starting to evolve to be um, recognized and be able to stand on their own and, you know, really be appreciated uh, and be valued and were an important, um, you know, opportunity that needed to be provided for people, for athletes with a disability around the globe. So, you know, I think it was a very interesting time politically as we were on one hand trying to get this little extra nudge of uh, full and equal treatment of athletes with a disability in the Olympic movement. And at the same time, use that momentum and that increasing awareness of the importance of the Paralympic Games and the Paralympic movement to the world as a whole. So it was a really interesting uh, time to be, um, you know, to be involved in, in sport for athletes with a disability for me from a professional perspective. Uh, Dave, back to your question of, um, you know, the choice of events that uh, we um, lobbied for uh, within the exhibition event kind of um, context. You know, I think Ted has described well the, the difference between um, the, the choice of events, the depth of athletic excellence, the depth and the number of countries that are able to participate in those exhibition events. And that's really what led to, you know, a, a pretty natural choice of the two high profile, uh, athletically very deep um, wheelchair track events where there were more countries competing. Uh, there was extreme athleticism being exhibited. So those were all the kind of backroom conversations that were happening because as leaders in sport for athletes with a disability at that time, we wanted to make sure that whatever exhibition events were approved that they portrayed sport for athletes with a disability in the most, in the, in the, in the best way possible so that the, the world could see um, the, the grace, the athleticism, the strength of athletes with a disability. So, you know, the, the track events were an easy one um, and a very appropriate one at the time. And, uh, but that's not to say that there were lots of, you know, backroom conversations around, you know, what other events might be included. At the end of our time with the Commission for Inclusion with Athletes with a Disability, around about kind of 1994 for me, it was just at that point that the Paralympic Games were really growing and, um, you know, establishing such credibility on the, the world athletic stage. So, yeah, I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you, Anne. And if, again, if I can pick up on the chronology piece of it, if I recall, so you stepped down in 94 and you're right. I think the Barcelona games in particular were a real step. Well, the, the Seoul games and then the Barcelona games. And I think it really put the, the Paralympic games on the map. And then I recall, Dr. Sedward, you giving a presentation to the IOC General Assembly in Atlanta, because I think I actually, so I would have been your graduate student at the time. And I remember helping make the overhead slides for your presentation. Can you imagine now making overhead slides to present to the IOC General Assembly? And you know, then they were in color, which I thought was just absolutely fantastic. Um, and you were presenting to them some other options with other disability groups. But I, uh, if we have time, we'll come back to that. And Eli, I know you wanted yeah. to, to, to spend a little bit of time. Eli, did you want to pose your question now? And after then- Pat, Maybe after Patrick. So I wanna, I wanna jump a little bit ahead now. So we had the, the demonstration events in Barcelona, Atlanta in 96, in Sydney in 2000. And then Pat, this is when, so you competed in Barcelona, in Barcelona in 92 and you became president of the Canadian Paralympic Committee in 99, if I recall correctly. And you were the chef for the Canadian team in Nagano in 98. You then got involved because we were leading up to the 2004 Olympic Games in Athens and uh, two very high, high profile athletes in a Canadian context, Chantal Petitclair and Jeff Adams were competing in, in the two exhibition events. You wrote a letter to the IOC challenging and questioning them 
on whether or not going back to Sharon's comments and, and Candace's comments too, if there was still value in the exhibition side of presenting people with disabilities within an Olympic context. I want you to maybe share a little bit more about kind of your position on that. Right, well, thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Uh, a bit like Anne's comments, I'm kind of looking at this, what I would call the AAA crowd. We have athletes, academics, and uh, administrators, but really a thank you to you on the screen here for how we've moved uh, the continuum in terms of Paralympic sport. Uh, a number of things were going through my head, time and place, and I, I, I think before I jump into my comments on the letter to the IOC, I just want to put perspective for all of us that I think as individuals, we tend to overestimate what we can do in any given day and underestimate what we can do in a year. But to Anne's comments about looking back on the Commonwealth Games in 94, but take a look at how much we've underestimated what would happen to Paralympic sport over the last 30, 40 years. So I think in that context, going to 2004 versus 1984 and 88 and Candace's and Sharon's experience, and whether it was appropriate to have an exhibition event, those were all questions as I went in and transitioned from uh, an athlete to an administrator. And thank you, David. It was actually a death grip on 11th. So thank you that I'm again bringing up the end of a talk because last place is a place I'm familiar with. Uh, but no, it was, it was taking a look at and defining and getting into that debate with the IOC and the IPC as to what purpose. And I, I would even quote uh, Dr. Stedward at one point had said that prolonged inclusion of these two events is patronizing. And that kind of set the context for me. But what I really started to look at is let's define this. Going back to the question that was posed earlier, what's the difference between demonstration and exhibition? I had the pleasure of sitting with Ted and he was talking about his experience in Calgary. And that was a true demonstration sport. And under the Olympic charter, a demonstration event is something that's being considered for inclusion in the Olympic Games and is typically a sport that is indigenous to the host nation. That was certainly not the case with wheelchair racing. It wasn't multidiscipline. It wasn't multidisability. It wasn't indigenous to any one nation. And it was never, ever truly being considered for inclusion. Um, and that's, I think, where my, I took umbrage with what was I saw as a regression. So yes, you have these incredible experiences, you know, Ted talking about uh, the opening and closing ceremony in 88. Uh, certainly Candace talking about the, the Coliseum and now to be etched in history on the wall of the stadium is incredibly powerful. Sharon talking about her athlete experience is going into that as a high performance athlete. Those things all moved along, but in 2004, all of a sudden, the language became very specific. At the summer events, and in a letter back to me, it was not a demonstration event. It was an exhibition event to promote the Paralympic Games. But when I say regression, is because in demonstration events, the IOC had always postulated that participants in demonstration events would be accorded all the rights, privileges, and treatment of any Olympic team member. Going into 2004, no access to the village. There would be no medals, not even a replica medal on a smaller scale. They would not be participating in the opening or closing ceremony. Uniforms would have to be supplied by their host nation at their choice. I just thought it was, I understand that by their very nature, high performance games, both Olympic and Paralympic games are discriminatory. You are making decisions that discriminate against individuals who are not qualified. But this was a different type of human level discrimination where you were talking about affording these things to the athletes and they were all being taken away. So what Ted had experienced in 88 and the athletes experienced in 84 in LA in terms of that welcoming, that was being taken away. We were definitely being position when I say we collectively, the Paralympic athletes, those athletes competing with the disability and being at just those two events, at least they got the gender right, they had men and women's events, um, there was equity there. But it was discrimination in the sense that you were a second class citizen. So my closing line to the IOC is, I think that the growth of the Paralympic Games had moved beyond being just an exhibition, which to me is almost denigrated to uh, an exhibition as in, a, in an event a circus in terms of the media hype that went around it. So at the end, in the last line of my letter, it was to the IOC was do it right or don't do it at all. 
they made their decision <laughs> that they were not going to do it at all. But I take a look at now with the Paralympic Games, and I think of any of us, when I'm looking at the, there were seven colleagues on the screen, if any of us 30 years ago, and I know how young all of us were, if somebody at that time had said that the serving president of the IOC would be on international TV talking about hosting the games in a major Asian city, i.e. Tokyo, and it rolls off his tongue so easily, it's hosting the Olympic and Paralympic Games. We have come a long ways. Agreed. Thank you, Patrick. And as I'm, as I'm looking at Anne, I can see the posters behind her for both Tokyo and Beijing. And I think you're right. I mean, that's the way that they're positioned now, right? The, as, equivalent, as equivalent games in many respects. And that's a far cry from what they were in the early 1980s. Um, Eli, I want to pass it over to you now, if I may, and because what, how we want to kind of finish up, so I know we have just under 10 minutes, or just over 10 minutes, which isn't a ton of time, but kind of the future, you know, and so the, so the, the, the exhibition events finished in 2004. They have not been continued since then. There's no discussion from the best of my knowledge of them being reinstated. But Eli, I want to pass it back to you to talk a little bit about maybe how we can look to the future. Yeah, no, thank you all so much. It's really amazing uh, conversation and perspective and history. Um, yeah, just in terms of thinking about and, and this question about what is the future and, and what if we were to reinstate uh, an inclusion initiative and so forth. And um, I've even seen even recently some sports like sailing and things like that, looking at events. Um, but the one sport, and I know Candice has touched on it and others have touched on it, um, is the sport of marathon. Just because the marathon all around the world, they're all so much inclusive and they have the divisions. And, and so we've, some of us have been talking about around the world that the marathon as a bridge sport, you know, because it's the last sport of the Olympics, um, that that sport in particular might be really interesting um, just because of the precedent that's already set around the world with the major marathons and so forth. And I'm saying, I just kind of wanted to share that and, and, and colleagues, we've all been talking about this a little bit, but just to kind of share other thoughts, other sports too, but just to start the conversation with the marathon. So we'd love to hear any thoughts on that. Thank you, Eli. And, and by the way, in my introductions of Eli, I forgot, I'm remiss at not mentioning that he too is a Paralympic athlete having Yoker. completed 96 the 96 and, and 2004 games in, in soccer as part of Team USA. So yeah, so thank you, Eli, for that, that, that conversation starter. And so I'll turn it back to our panelists. Yeah, just... Where does the future of inclusion for athletes with disability and able-bodied athletes look like in the future? Is marathon a possible perhaps restart of these combined events within an Olympic and Paralympic context? Again, I'm, I, I'm interested in the thoughts of our panelists and I'll open it up to anyone who wishes to, to jump forward. Well, I'll, I'm going to jump in this, Candace. And um, so that's, you know, that was our thought in the early 80s when we developed those guidelines for race directors and we, we traveled around and were the ambassadors basically, you know, and alleviating their fears about what might and could happen and why we needed to start first and uh, the safety piece of it. Uh, and I always, we always thought, all of us that were involved with road racing, that it was such a perfect way to include. In fact, for myself, my first experience of feeling like I was included back in the world after my spinal cord injury at the age of 21 in 1975 was a 5K at Griffith Park in Los Angeles here in my 50 pound stainless steel Everest mm -hmm. and wheelchair. I crossed the same, the same start line, I did the same course, I crossed the same finish line. And there was this feeling of, wow, I'm included back in something because I felt so excluded in so much because there was limited, I mean, if anything else, limited physical access and things. So road racing, I think is a, is a really a great place. I personally don't think there's a reason for inclusion in the Olympic games, personally. I think that as Paralympic athletes and administrators and the people that build the sport and that will come next and that have come before, that we have a real opportunity to take it to the next level of human, you know, human, human inclusion in everything. 
you know, no matter what it is. And with Paralympic Games, we have an opportunity to show that, that we offer also another experience experience and and that experience the marathon be an example of that spirit and that connectivity and because it's happening all around the world it seems like that instead of having two separate marathons you know why would you create a separation well, yeah and i totally you know i love the idea eli i totally love the idea of it being together and but i also see it together all over the world already okay. and i i don't I don't think that, I personally don't think that the IOC or the IPC have marketed the Paralympic Games in a really well done way that creates true equity, true equity. I mean, still our broadcast is dismal and our exposure is around an idea of overcoming, which is really not the point here. It's dismantling those impressive situations. And so that's why I think there's so much opportunity if we really focus on well, building that. Up that Paralympic piece. I mean, one of the things Toyota is doing this year is doing a sponsorship of all U.S. Paralympic athletes that make the U.S. Paralympic team. They're not including Olympians in this. That is pretty phenomenal and ballsy from my perspective because I said you're going to get a lot of blowback on this from Olympic That's a athletes. huge where's huge mine? step forward where's mine? yeah and Paralympic athletes yeah, forever Patrick, like, Patrick. where's mine where's mine yeah and mm -hmm. I mean we still have a problem with language I mean, it was mentioned that we heard Olympic and Paralympic together in a statement in the US OPC it's a struggle still for a lot of leadership to be able to say them together and especially Olympic athletes and and really opening it up. So, yeah, I thank you, Candace. I'm feeling really good. A long ways we've come a long ways, but there's okay. still perhaps a ways to go. So, so let, if I can, hang on, Ted. I saw Pat. A few more minutes, but yeah. Okay. I saw Pat had his hand up. I want to make sure we get to him. Okay. So no, they're, they're great questions, Eli. And I, in terms of the broader question of inclusion, and uh, I always ask to what end? Uh, I think Paralympic athletes have answered the question loud and clearly about legitimacy, about their athletic ability. And also on that same level, they've answered the question of achievement. If it would suit a multi-purpose, so maybe it, maybe it is the marathon, and maybe it is sailing. Maybe there is some events. Uh, I mean, I was also caught up in the whole thing with the IAAF and people with prosthetics. And do they have a, an advantage uh, competing as a leg amputee with a prosthetic? Those are big questions. Uh, the question I would put back to also think about this, if there was inclusive events, and I think the Commonwealth Games has moved a great deal forward in terms of how they treat it, multi-disability, multi, uh, multi-discipline, but also full medal status, it counts in the tally, that's great. The question I would put forward is if it's then an included event or discipline in the Olympic Games, should it also still remain in the Paralympic Games? Should those athletes have a disproportionate number of opportunities to earn, to earn medals at both an Olympic and Paralympics? And that's the other questions you start to ask, does that then degrade or what does that do to the other event? I think the problem just, we hang on, hang on, hang on one sec, Ted. So just, I just, we're, we're almost minutes away from finishing up and I do want to give Dr. Sedward a quick minute just to kind of sum up the, the conversation, but Ted, I'll pass it to you for just a quick comment. We have been looking at this as a binary sort of perspective. I think we should scrap that. We can begin to look at creating new events in various disciplines that actually create a, a, a new perspective intentionally. I mean, if they if the IOC can look at esports, what the hell? We can actually, you know, any sport agenda, pick a sport, is up for change modern pentathlon going to one day event, for example. So we need to be more creative in that perspective. We need to look at what joins together, what is additive, not seen as you know either or. And I think that's where we bring it into another level and not, yeah, there's a lot of first world issues here that you know we've made great strides, but when we look at this globally, it may not translate that well. Thank I think you. we need to look at this very creatively and I do think there is a, a space to relook at, you know, the work and, you know, 
you and others did, um, you know, under CIAD way back when. I think it's time to take a re renewed look at this. Thank you, Ted. Dr. Sedward, they are the Sedward talks, so I'll provide you with some final, uh, a, a final minute for some comments. Uh, thank you very much, David. And happy birthday. Happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I've just been listening in in all this uh, last uh, 90 minutes here with the in, enthusiasm of some of the greatest leaders in sport and uh, Paralympians uh, that we've uh, that we have in our movement and and uh, it would be nice for the young upcoming Paralympians to listen to people like Sharon and Candace and their experiences that they had so many years ago and yet likely aren't much different than what they may have today. Uh, has the Paralympic uh, movement and games changed? Absolutely. Uh, I remember the, the challenges that I had as the founding president back in 89 to 01. It was very, very challenging to take care of internal problems, let alone trying to promote our, our movement within the IOC, within the international federations, within the media, within the countries, and with everyday citizens uh, and friends and family that we have. So I would, I would think we, we've come a long way. We've got lots of challenges yet, uh, but I just have to personally thank uh, Candace and Sharon and Patrick and, and Ted and Anne uh, for one, for their leadership over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, um, and thank you for being such a, an important part of the Steadward Talks and, and uh, uh, just thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been a great, uh, a great morning and I look forward to the next time we, we get together and I hope particularly uh, Candace and Sharon that our paths will cross one day as we get the, this pandemic behind us because it's a, so, nice to see, so nice to see you again and, and Anne particularly, we spent so many years together Patrick's just down the road, so it's a little easier. And Ted, so nice to see you again, too. And uh, thank you for your contributions. So with that, I see that we've gone over time. I want to reiterate Dr. Sedward's comments and thanks to our speakers today. It was an absolute thrill to pull you all together. As just a, as a Paralympic fan, uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, you know, kind of trying to moderate and I apologize for cutting, cutting you off and not en enabling us to have a fulsome conversation. We probably could have done this for another hour and a half. Mm -hmm. um, as to future said we're talks, we don't have any planned right now. So, you know, so if you have an idea, send it, send it to me and Eli, uh, you know, or, and Ted, like we're, we're happy to consider future ideas and future topics. So we always welcome your ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Uh, fingers crossed that the Olympic and Paralympic Games, uh, we're able to watch those coming up this summer, and we will see you again, hopefully sometime soon. Take care and have a great Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. Oh, thanks so Everybody. much. Great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Happy birthday, Bob. Thank you, Anne. Be well, everyone. <laughs>